All right. Hi, guys. Uh, we're going to get started. Um, we don't have a title slide, so we're just going to, or we don't have an intro slide, so we're going to give you guys a little bit of info of who we are. I'm John Brown. My name is Ben Purdy. Whoa, I very hot I feel like hot you're mic. way louder than I am. I am. Uh, my name is Ben Purdy. Uh, I'm John Brown. We just went through that. I think cool. the mics are better now. Is okay, better? so uh, I'm, uh, we're both from Portland, Oregon. I uh, work at a digital creative agency called Instrument, and I used to work with Ben Purdy about a year ago. Uh, and then about a year ago, I decided to step away from Instrument, and I started my own little studio called Glowbox. Yeah, we both are really into creative technology, making JavaScript, art, and putting in the in the real world. So that's what we're here to talk to you guys about. So uh, this is our agenda. We're going to get through it. So when we say art, go to the next slide. Next slide. <laughs> so here's what we do. Uh, we like to combine JavaScript and art and do them in really weird ways. And we're going to show you a bunch of projects. Uh, it should be really great. We have, a, we have an assortment of things on stage. Yeah, the sort of stuff that we do typically involves, um, like John said, JavaScript, obviously, that's why we're here. Um, but we tend to focus on things that involve um, crossing over into the physical world a little more. And so we're going to talk a little bit about some projects that we've done and some of the techniques and tools that we use to do that sort of stuff. Totally. But I know what you guys are thinking. Why? Why, are we, why do we do this? Uh, so there's a lot of really good answers to that. But the first one, uh, it's challenging. And we're going to split this into two camps. So one, it's challenging if you work uh, with the e-commerce platform all day to go home and totally switch your brain into something else art side. Uh, it uses a completely different set of uh, neurons. So that's super challenging. And it's also challenging when you want to put something into the physical world that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, like you want to connect a loom to your computer. It's a very challenging uh, proposition. It makes you think about things you wouldn't normally think about and combining physical things. The second part is that it's really magical once you do get those things working. Uh, so something, uh, something like a generative animated graphics kind of a, a project might be really awesome on a screen, but if you project it onto some piece of sculptural work, uh, that, hello? that makes it instantly more magical. <laughs> uh, with, without changing any of the code, you will, uh, it just gives it a whole new interesting aspect because it's out in the 3D world. Uh, and then finally, it's really, really rewarding. I'm just going to... It's super rewarding because when you do <laughs> put it up uh, in the physical space, uh, you get to actually be there and see people experience it and the joy uh, that they get for it. Um, you can put something up on, the, on a website and it can be super beautiful and really awesome, but you never get to really get that one-to-one like, -one, uh, interaction, which is why it's really great to do stuff in the physical space from an artistic standpoint. All right. Uh, so we want to give you a warning here, in case you haven't noticed, there's going to be a lot of live demos. There's going to be a lot of live demos, uh, live and demos. we're basically running all of the networking off of his phone back there, so if any of it works, it's going to be awesome. Yeah. So, uh, so with that said, we're really yeah, this is not a joke. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is talk about a project that kind of embodies most of the things that we talked about in terms of why we like to do this kind of work, uh, and that is a project that John and I worked on together. This, we heard a lot about passion projects so far at the conference, and this is definitely one of those. John and I, since we don't work together anymore, we get together once a week or so uh, and just kind of jam on stuff like this. Uh, but we decided to submit a piece of artwork to a JavaScript conference in Portland called Cascadia JS. Which Tracy, one of the organizers here, is my microphone on? Nope. No. <laughs> Keep going. Keep All right. So anyhow, uh, <laughs> Tracy, one of the organizers uh, <laughs> of Empire, uh, worked on that, and so we decided to um, see if we could take something that was JavaScript powered, and rather than just having it run on a screen at the conference, we wanted to make something that, again, broke out into the physical space. And so we brainstormed a little bit, and we decided that we wanted to take the game of Plinko from The Price is Right, um, which, as we all know, is the best game on The Price is Right, uh, and we wanted to combine that uh, with JavaScript, because this was a JavaScript conference and a JavaScript art experience that we were trying to build. And so what we decided to do was take the physical movement from the puck on the Plinko board, try to capture that somehow, and then use that to drive generative artwork that we would then project back onto the board. That sounds complicated. It does. So uh, how do we even get started on a project like that? So like I said, one of the challenging bits is how do you even make these things happen in the physical space? Like, I haven't checked in the last couple of weeks, Ben, but I don't think you can go on Amazon and just order a Plinko board that's connected to the internet. Not that I know of. Okay, so we're working on that patent pending. So the very first thing that you want to do is you got to figure out how you're actually going to get it to work. So what we did is uh, Ben and I work on projects. He had a bunch of sensors. We took a piezo sensor. We hot glued a nail to it, stuck it through a board, dropped a piece of acrylic, boom. It's very blurry, but that's actually saying uh, something like thumbs up. Yeah. 
So we had one pin working, uh, but obviously one pin does not a Plinko board make. Uh, so we scaled it up, the prototype um, went up to 10 pins, that video's not playing, that's fine. Anyhow, we got three sensors working and we started projecting onto it, um, which looked great, looks like this. Uh, just even seeing a little bit of light on the pins made it look awesome, and we knew that we were onto something, so then it was just a matter of um, buying all the gear. The final board was maybe like, I don't know, four and a half feet by six feet. It was 85 80, pegs. 85 pegs and a whole lot of like little custom circuit boards and a microcontroller. Yeah, one, uh, one thing you have to do 85 times. It's real yeah. complicated. So Monotonous. Uh, so what's the, what's, the, what's the payoff here? It's that reward we talked about. So we didn't actually make it to the Cascadia event through many, uh, many problems, many fail failures, but we kept working on it. But we did get it into a gallery a couple months ago. Uh, we've taken it to a bunch of meetups, and the, the most amazing part is that people sort of, there's like text on screen, and they think they understand what's happening. They pick a puck up, they walk up, they drop it, and they turn around, and there's just a smile on their face, except for one guy on here who looks really grumpy. But, um, <laughs> but it's, it's like, it's that one-to-one, -one, it's that super rewarding piece uh, where you actually get to interact with that person. Absolutely. So, Ben, yeah. <laughs> That wasn't even one of the demos, so that bodes well. Uh, so Ben, so we were making that for a JavaScript art conference. We're at a JavaScript conference now. I want to know, there was uh, sensors and Arduinos, there's a lot of stuff in there. Where's the actual JavaScript come in? Well, John, it's basically everywhere. Oh! Uh, oh so my. everything that was being projected out onto the board, all of that generative artwork, um, all of the sort of attract mode and UI stuff uh, was being projected out. It was just a full screen instance of Chrome uh, with some like canvas trickery that we were doing. Um, and then on the back end, there was a node instance running and a little uh, computer in the kiosk that was looking for the peg strikes. It was sending it to the front end saying, hey, I just got hit, or I just hit here. It was saving those animations. You could put your Twitter handle in, it would tweet it to you so you could live the magic forever. Uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty great. The JavaScript was everywhere. There was maybe 40 lines of code to actually like, sense, the, sense the voltage spikes. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of a wrap up of, of a project that we did that in, sort of involved a lot of this stuff. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is one of the specific techniques that made it possible, uh, which is projection mapping. And I don't know if, an, if anybody knows what this means, but it's basically a phrase used to describe projecting video content onto objects that aren't necessarily just like a big rectangular screen lined up nicely with a projector. Uh, and there's a lot of tools to do this in the software realm. There, um, you know, large-scale projection mapping on buildings and that sort of thing is nothing new. Um, but none of this stuff runs in the browser. This is all like really heavy um, native applications that people use for media production. Uh, and because we were doing this for Cascadia JS, we did not want um, to stray outside the browser. We could have just taken the output from the browser and piped it through one of these existing tools, but we decided that would just not be good. Yeah, JavaScript. Woo! Uh, so. Um, Tell us how it works. So this is basically how we did it. So say you have some, some weird content that you want to render out uh, into a canvas, which is basically stuck in a rectilinear shape, uh, but you need to get it onto something that is maybe not lined up with a projector, like some sort of weird foam core sculpture, or even just like the Plinko board, it was just at a funny angle uh, relative to the projector. Well, basically what you need to do is you need to get that content distorted so that it matches that, that perspective distortion that the object you want to project onto uh, would be um, presenting to the projector lens. Uh, and luckily, CSS3D is basically like ready to go for this problem. Uh, using the, the uh, transform matrix 3D, you can uh, apply perspective transform to any DOM element. And so we typically just use this with a canvas, but you could do like any, any sort of markup would work with this. Um, so, stop, Ben, Ben, stop. Demo time. Demo time, <laughs> all right. There's so, gonna be a lot of these. So I'm gonna go over here. I'm gonna grab a piece of this uh, foam core that we're gonna use to actually show the projection mapping on backstage. Uh, so Ben, if you could turn the projector on for us. Yeah, let's see if this works. Is it gonna work? Oh my god, it worked. Turned on with Node, everybody. That's Node. All right. That wasn't even the whole demo. Let me just get this out of the way. All right, uh, so let me just bring this up a little bit. Hold it up a little more. All right, so you can see that's not lined up at all. Uh, but with CSS 3D, if I just take these corner points and I just move this around, as soon as it gets lined up, what you're seeing on the main projector is the geometry of this thing as it's actually being projected out. Uh, so you can see it's like I'm projecting a really skewed thing 
but because it's skewed the same way, hang on, what is it get this lined up? Because it's being projected the same way that that foam core is sort of uh, at a funny angle to the projector, once you get things lined up, it's like this crazy magic happens, right? <laughs> All right. And again, like that, that would just be a thing that I could have running on the, uh, the laptop screen otherwise. And this is not a crazy fancy projector, it's a normal projector. Um, all right, so let's see if we can turn it back off. Will it work twice? I doubt it. Oh my god. Oh. All right. Uh, so that's a really, really, really good way to get, that was a lot of really, so that was a, that's a great way to get into uh, taking your art and your JavaScript and taking it out of just a screen and putting it into the real world. You can go to a garage sale, buy a $25 really old projector, and you can map your stuff to foam core like that. Uh, it's really, really great. And obviously, like we said, we use this with Plinko uh, because it allows us a really um, flexible physical setup. We can like, take it to a meetup or something, just drop it anywhere, and within a couple of minutes, we've got it like, really dialed in. And then all of that animation you saw in the video is like, really registered nicely to the board. Uh, it also you know, is nice. It avoids non-browser-based tools. We can run this on anything that can run Node and Chrome, which is pretty, pretty nice. Um, and originally, we had it built into the whole Plinko rendering pipeline. This um, little projection mapping tool was just built because we needed it for that piece. Uh, but it turned out to be something that seemed really useful. Let's make it reusable. Woo! So if you go to that link, uh, I made this library called MapTastic.js. Uh, you can basically just drop it into your project if you're already doing some kind of crazy um, dynamic graphical thing or you just want to play around with, with uh, projection mapping or if you just want to make it easier to line up your uh, Reveal.js slides. Um, one line of code will like, add all of that drag and drop behavior to any element. Next slide. So, so oh, it looks like this when you're doing the editing mode. Um, and then all of the coordinates and everything get saved in local storage, so if you need to uh, reload, it just pops back into place. Really great. So go out there, get yourself a $25 projector, pick one out of the garbage can, and get into the 3D physical world with art. Okay, <laughs> so that's how you get stuff from your flat screen out into the real world. So let's talk about how to get stuff from the real world into your flat screen. All, all right? right? Right. All right, let's go hardware. Let's talk about hardware. All right, well, one really awesome thing, and we've seen a lot of that at the conference so far, is that uh, vendors are embracing the web as a media platform in a pretty awesome way. Like a lot of the, the hardware that comes out on Kickstarter that actually makes it out into the real world, um, they treat the browser like a, a first-class citizen in terms of uh, supporting that as a media platform. Um, and so really it feels like with all the crazy devices that are coming out now, uh, we're all sort of like kids in a candy store. So let's take a walk through the candy store. All right. Connect. Connect version 2 just came out. It's a really great platform. I'm sure most of you know it, uh, but you can track your skeleton, and you can figure out your depth, and it'll track your body. Now, you and like eight other friends, imagine all the cool generative art that you can do, like a one-to-one -one of what you're doing with your body, or do something really fun and ambient. But Ben, we're talking about JavaScript, and I want to know, can I use WebSockets just to pipe this data in to well, my project? John Brown, you can use WebSockets. Boom. <laughs> Microsoft, Microsoft has been kind enough. They've, Microsoft has really been embracing the creative uh, coding community, and um, they have released software that will hook right up to the Connect and just start piping all of that tracking data over a WebSocket that you can hook up to your awesome JavaScript project. Okay, so that's macro. Let's go micro. Let's say we just want to play, uh, do something with our hands, right? That sounded weird and creepy. I apologize. <laughs> so. The connect is basically, or the leap motion is a connect for your hands, where you can uh, rotate your hand, it'll tell you what you're doing with it. It's super precise, uh, really good. Again, you can make fun, generative art with it. But, Ben, like uh, we just had a conversation, I want to know if I want to make something with JavaScript, and I want to put this into my application, does it have web sockets? It has web sockets. Boom. <laughs> So the Leap Motion software that, that it, you know, comes with the hardware uh, fires up a server that you can connect to. Um, they have a lot of examples that come with the SDK, and it's super easy to get started. OK, so this is where it gets weird. So we're talking about the physical world. It starts to get weird. It's, so we're talking about the physical world. Let's talk about what's in here, where, wh what's important. It's what's in your brain. So there are commercially available products that you can take you can uh, track what's going on in your brain, what you're thinking about, and all the varying waves of your brain status. And that is awesome. Imagine all the really brain status. Imagine all the really awesome art that you could make just by figuring out if you're hungry or sad or just a general malaise. Oh, that was a terrible. Just like generally what's happening in your brain. So, Ben, same question. I want to make generative art with this and I want to know, can I just drop it, use some web socks, just get it in? You can indeed. <laughs> Boom. All right. So, 
let's, what's next? Oh, right. So you guys actually already learned a lot about uh, VR headsets uh, earlier on Monday. Nope, it's Monday. On Sunday. So the really interesting thing that we, we saw with this is that uh, you need polyfills and you need a bunch of libraries. But Ben, I'm curious. Could we, in theory, <laughs> just set this up with, I don't know, maybe some native support? Uh, you know what? You can. Boom! Soon. OK, well, that's so. fine. And this, to anybody that saw the, uh, the VR talk, this is obviously not a surprise, but the, uh, like the nightly build of um, Firefox and um, Chromium. Is it Chromium? No. Yes, Chromium. Anyway, the, the beta builds of Chrome are including native support for that. So check yeah, it so, out if you have a chance. Yeah, so uh, Ben, I'm looking at this screen. It's been a while. These people are getting antsy. Uh, I feel like we need to do another demo. What do you think? I think it's time to say, think, oh, oh, oh. wow. <laughs> Blue that one, Domo Arigato. Mr. Mr. Roboto. Roboto. Okay. So they only get better. <laughs> All right. Tell them, what I'm, tell them what I'm doing, Ben. All right. Well, he, this is the Rave Wave that was pictured earlier, which, as you know, supports WebSockets. Uh, and so, oh, oh, there. What's we're fighting on? over it now. You do it. Okay. You do it. You, you do it. I'll walk you through it. Take the clicker. Take the clicker. Oh. All right. We rehearsed this so much. So let's say Ben walks into a party and he wants to. Uh, run the lights, and he wants to control the visuals and what the sounds are going, all with his brain. Well, with one quick... Whoa. This is all what's happening in Ben's brain right now. Are you hungry? Okay, let's move on. So, so this is just one example of taking streams of data that are coming in your alpha waves, your beta waves, your theta waves, your gamma waves. I don't know what any of those mean, but I know that they're coming in over web sockets, and then I'm generating music and the color palette and the visuals all from Ben's brain. So this is one really great way to just take data, abstract it, and uh, make really fun stuff. Cool. Are we still on our presentation layer? I think. Woo! OK. All right. So that was another demo. It was. Another way that you could potentially get some data in to your uh, art is by using ex uh, non-physical external sources. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah. Like if, if hardware isn't your thing, but you're still really interested in doing some of this uh, generative artwork and interaction experiments, um, this is a way that you can do that. So I started a project uh, last year called Uncontext. And what it is, is it's publicly available web sockets that you can connect, connect to. And so if you look at this data, it doesn't have any like significant parameters. It's uncontextualized, and it's slowly changing over time. And so you could you, you connect to this, and you want to use D to control the color, and you could use E to control the speed, and F to control the number of particles. All this data doesn't care what you're doing with it. It's not IDs, and it's not names, and it's not timestamps. So the idea behind this is to use this, take it into a generative art project, and then create something that moves and that is, uh, has like a heartbeat to it. But it's also not random. That's an important part. Yes, it's also not random. It all moves to a rhythm, and it has rules to it. All right. Well, taking on context, um, let me caveat that with uh, that John and I are both part of the uh, Creative Coders group in Portland, and, uh, and that we had a hack day using Uncontext. So I released a new stream uh, that nobody knew what the, uh, the data was going to be. They didn't know what the context and where I was deriving all that data from is. And so we got together about 30 people in a room, and everybody made some really cool art visualization projects. And then about an hour before the end of the day, Ben pulls me aside. So I had done a, um, some stuff with 3JS, and there were a couple hours left, and I had this idea. I wanted, to, um, I wanted to take the uncontext data and hook it up to a Nintendo emulator just to kind of mash buttons and see what would happen. Uh, and so what I expected was, and what happened was, that it would play Nintendo very badly. Uh, however, it turned out to be really, really fun to watch. And I don't know why that is. And maybe it's just because every now and then it starts to seem to do really well, only to do really stupid things, <laughs> because it has no idea what's going on. It's just pushing buttons randomly. Uh, and so that was just kind of like a, a really hacked together thing I did at the end of the day. And then um, I, based on how interesting it was to watch, I decided that um, I wanted to take Uncontext and I wanted to make it play a real Nintendo, uh, still badly. And so it's time now. What's the time for? The Nintendo demo. Boom. <laughs> All right. This may be the most perilous demo. Okay. I'm ready for it. 
All right. Oh. There's no way to make this always So if allow. you're in the back and you can't see, we have a Nintendo up here. It's connected to a TV. I'm going to turn this on. Let's see what happens. Here we go. Oh, it's working. Yeah. All right, so that, that is WebSocket data that's being used. No, wait a second, oh, this is the demo. Oh. This is the demo. Is it the demo? I don't even know. See, sometimes it does really well. It's weird. Uh, so this is, this is what the Raspberry, so it's a Raspberry Pi running Holy. node that is, uh, this I've never, holy crap. Oh my God, right? <laughs> we did not plan this. This is just random, random shenanigans, <laughs> right? So, um, it doesn't know what's happening on the screen. There's just a light sensor so that I know when it's gone to black when the guy dies because every three times you got to restart. Mario, yeah. you fool. Anyway, like I said, turned out to be really fun. Uh, this whole thing, like you just plug it in and if it's got an internet connection, it'll just start playing. And I've, um, I've had it like, you know, this counter has been reset a few times, but it's probably close to 10,000 plumbers that we've lost at this point. And it shows no signs of stopping. Um, so that's that. Did you, tell, did you tell them how it worked? Yeah. Okay. All right, we're gonna we're gonna get this off the screen, or we're all gonna just we'll get just stuck gonna, watching. We're just it. gonna let it run. <laughs> Wait, should uh, I turn it off? We can just let it run. We'll just let it run. You all guys, right. there you go. That's for you. Um, so that's pretty much it. We're gonna wrap it up with some some final thoughts. Um, so here we go. Yeah. So one thing we really want you guys to do is try this at home. Uh, getting into art is like it's it may seem really weird, and you may not think of yourself as an artist, but just getting in, getting your hands dirty, and just doing it, and not say, getting out of your head and not saying, oh, I'm not an artist, this is what I do, I'm an engineer. Try it, it's, it's super rewarding, and you get better with it, just like any skill. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if you're not familiar with hardware, like, you know, soldering and, and circuits and that sort of thing, like, the best thing to do is just, just try it, and, you know, let the magic smoke out a few times, and it's just really fun. A lot, a lot of people understood that. That's great, that's awesome. <laughs> Uh, the second thing is that, um, as we all know, it's like, oh my god, it's full of JS, right? So if it exists, I believe that you can hook it up to JavaScript, and Projectors, you probably should Nintendo's. hook it up to JavaScript. Um, so don't, don't feel like if you're you know, like a, a, a web developer and you're thinking about getting into robotics that there's a reason that you shouldn't take your existing skills and, uh, and find a way to apply them there, because there's just no way like, not to have fun doing this kind of stuff. Um, and there's also data all around us. So like we talked about how to get data in from hardware, we talked about on context, like we're just sort of swimming in a, in a sea of all this data that we can hook up to interesting ideas and, uh, and sort of breathe life into things that would otherwise just exist on their own. Um, and in fact, uh oh, this might be the, final, the demo. final demo. Maybe. All right, well moving right along, there is data all around us, John. Yeah, so I don't know if any of you can see, but I'm wearing this band on my arm. And what this is, is it's a Mayo from Thalmic Labs and it's tracking the rotation the orientation, the pitch of my arm. So as I do these things, I gesture a lot when I give conference talks. So I thought, let's actually use my motion and let's generate, oh, it's up there. Let's like generate some art. So this is, this entire time, I've been creating these weird bubbly landscapes. I, I programmed this demo on the plane right home, or the plane right here, so it's a little janky, but, uh, oh, oh, okay. So here's the really cool part, is that this is happening for you guys, right? You guys are all experiencing this. But what if I told you that I was actually, this whole time, making art for everybody? I won't get out. <laughs> <laughs> so with each section of the, uh, the slide deck. Oh, those are just blank slides. It's those been are just asking us images. to sign up for Twitter. Again, this is all going through his phone. Oh, there's one. There we go. There's a couple. That's the same one. That's the same one. Anyway, I was going to plan. Uh, so there's a way to make data at any time uh, all around you. So. <laughs> all right. Um, so one of the other takeaways, and I feel like this is a really important one, uh, is to bring a buddy. So when you do this kind of stuff, it's great to get out of the vacuum and get, um, like get ideas going back and forth with somebody else. Uh, and that is something that makes sense um, like between disciplines and also with, within the same discipline. John and I are both primarily engineers, like software developer guys, um, but we still have a great time getting together and kind of like throwing ideas around and I feel like when you have somebody else in the room working on something with you, um, you tend to push yourself a little further and, and get yourself out of your like, technology comfort zone a little more to try to like, make something better together. As well as designers, if you're working with, you can uh, 
we're cross-discipline, and that engenders even more uh, fun and creativity. So, all right. There's um, this idea of uh, working with a friend, but let's work with a lot of friends. Right, bring uh, a lot of buddies. Yeah, bring a whole bunch of buddies. So, uh, Ben and I are both part of a creative code group in Portland. Uh, it's a really great community where we get together, we challenge each other to do better and to make great stuff. Uh, and so, we want you guys to join a creative code group. So, there's a lot of people here from out of town. Is anybody in here from Chicago? Not, Next slide. Is anybody one. in here? Well, if you were. Is anybody here from Nashville? Nobody. Next slide. Is anybody in here from New York City? All right. So you guys have do two slides. So these are two really great groups here in town that you guys should check out. They're doing really fun, interesting stuff with data and, and generative art. There's also a little thing called Brooklyn JS, uh, which you guys may have heard of. I'm sure there's, I mean, apparently there's a Staten Island JS. Yeah, and that's a joke. I don't understand that joke. Uh, <laughs> But, but there's also, I'm sure, other borough JSs. Is that true? Man, Manhattan JS, Queens JS, and another borough that I think. Jersey. All right. Well, I don't know what they're saying. Uh, so <laughs> I'm from Portland. So, uh, so go, to your, go to your JavaScript meetups and start talking about art and finding, find somebody that, that motivates them. Like, look around. Anybody that's still here is in at, already at the party that, uh, that's, like, looking around? because I'm telling them to look around, these are your peers. These are people that are potentially interested in making art. And I would also love it if you guys just made, made a language agnostic group, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's great to have meetups about specific technologies, but you don't get that cross-pollination quite as much. At the Portland Creative Coders, we have designers that show up. We had like a boat builder show up one time, and so it's great. It was awesome. It's great just to get people, like get a bunch of people together in a room that are just interested in doing creative stuff together, because it sort of breaks down like, the um, like apprehension that people might have about like not knowing enough about a certain technology or technique. Yeah. So, so that's it. With all that, we want to say thanks. This is us. Hold on. This is us. Uh, this is us. We're going to have our slides up. We've been, we've been working with this stuff for the last two days, so we don't have our slides up online, but mark this they, down. They will be there. They will be there within three weeks. Uh, <laughs> And also, we just want to take a really quick moment uh, to say thank you to all of you guys uh, for uh, being here and being a part of the community. Like, obviously, this wouldn't be wouldn't be able to be uh, put on without you guys. Absolutely. Um, and then also the go ahead. We wanted to also thank the organizers. Obviously, like th they've been amazing. This is no small feat to put a, an event like this together, and they do a phenomenal job. And uh, obviously, none of us would be here without their support. And also, we would not be here without the sponsors. So that's really awesome. Uh, They've, they've literally fed and clothed us for the last couple of days, which is pretty great. Uh, so make sure you guys say thank you to organizers, uh, volunteers, the MCs, uh, the sponsors, everybody. So. All right, and we're going to take most of this down, but if you want to come up and, um, and see it up close, it'll be here for yeah, a couple Yeah, if anybody wants to see their brains working or they want to roll around like this, just come up and we'll, and we'll, we'll uh, hook you up. All right, thanks. Maybe. Maybe I can't. <laughs>